Several years ago, uh, I was driving our daughter down to Southern California for her to see and visit her aunt and uncle. And it was during the winter time and it had been raining and whatnot, but we were making our way down to Southern California traveling along Interstate 5. And as we got closer to Southern California, we started to notice some signs that started to appear alongside the road. And the sign said that the grapevine uh, was closed due to snow. Now, those of you that know Interstate 5, you know that the grapevine is that mountain that, that you have to go over to get into Southern California down to Los Angeles. And so I, I noticed the sign and everybody's driving along just fine. And I, they started saying, hey, use an alternate route. And, and uh, now a rational person, a rational person would have probably started thinking about an alternate route. But I was confused uh, because everybody that was traveling alongside of me was traveling at a good speed and they were passing all the alternate routes that might have been available. And I was confused and I thought, surely they know something I don't know and something that the sign does not know. And that must be that the grapevine is reopened after it's snowing the night before. And, and surely this, the grapevine would be open. I could get over it. So I, I just kept driving along. And alternative route after alternative route passed by and everybody just moving toward the grapevine. At last, we came to the last off-ramp that would have led to an alternate route. And man, traffic is flowing at a full speed. And I'm thinking, surely the grapevine's open. Well, we passed that, that off-ramp. And within short time, maybe a couple miles, five miles, all of a sudden, we came to a stop. And for over two hours, my daughter and I set in traffic as we inched and crept our way along toward the grapevine. At last, we got to the bottom of the grapevine and our friendly CHP officers were turning us around and heading us back to Bakersfield and around to Southern California. I had so many opportunities to turn around, but I thought because everybody was doing it, we were fine. I told my daughter, man, what a lesson this is. It took me about four hours longer than it should have taken me to get to Southern California because I didn't listen to the signs. Well, this morning, I want us to look at some signs that God's Word has placed before us. The Bible speaks about a life of purity that God has called us to. And the Bible tells us, hey, we are to live moral lives. It's very easy for you and me to ignore signs. With signs of caution, signs of warning. As everybody else seems to be doing it. I don't know if you are like me, but a lot of times we have these, these patterns of sin in our lives and these patterns of sin cause us to, 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 we battle them for a while and we get victory for a season and then they raise their ugly head up again and we fall back into it. And everybody else is doing it and we get complacent and we ignore the signs. Well, this morning I want us to look back into the book of 1 Samuel we're in the middle of a series that we have called Becoming a Person After God's Heart. And this morning, we want to, to take a, a look again at our rebellion and God's plan. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're going to dive in here together. Now, a little backdrop here is that the nation of Israel has enemies. They've always had enemies. They're always going to have enemies. And uh, the nation is made up of not just of a nation, but of people, individuals uh, who are a part of the nation of Israel. And these people have chosen to rebel and to sin. Uh, it hasn't just happened once or twice. It's a pattern of sin that they have fallen into that we're going to look at this morning. And before I get into the text, I want you to puzzle over something. I'd like to ask you the question. Is there a pattern of sin in your life that you've become accustomed to, perhaps because everybody else is doing it or just because, well, it's kind of a pattern. It's a habit. I want you to listen to God's word. Now, one of the things I'm praying for and have been praying for is that I would preach this message with both boldness and grace. There are certain times when we get to passages of scripture like that we're going to look at this morning, that I kind of wish that somebody else was up here preaching it. 
kind of wish maybe I was out there with you listening to somebody else preach to me. Because we all have these things in our lives that we might be, that we tolerate, that is actually the opposite of what God has called us to do. And we need a message like this. And so as I preach this morning, I, I, do, I pray I do so with both humility, boldness, honesty, and grace as we communicate this together. For whatever reason God has orchestrated for that I be here this morning and I get to sit in this seat for us to learn and grow together. Now, quick review before we get into the text. Uh, you'll remember Hannah. Hannah prays for a son. She prays for a son and she's barren, she's unable to have children, and God answers the prayer. And she conceives and gives birth to a little boy named Samuel. And Samuel, she raises, she teaches him about the Lord, but she had made a vow to the Lord that once he is weaned, once he's a little older, she was going to take him and bring him to the temple where he would be raised by the priest at that time, Eli. So, so that's the backdrop here. And so Samuel now is in that little, in the temple. And let me show you the world that Samuel's growing up in. It's a dark world, actually. Take a look, if you will, at 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to be all over the map in, in 1 Samuel today, but you have your Bibles ready. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. It says this. Now the sons of Eli. Now these were the priests. Their names were Hophni and Phinehas. And uh, listen to what it says. I, this is not what you want God to say about you, but listen to what it says. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. That's a terrible thing to have said about you, right? These were men who were priests. They were supposed to know God. They were supposed to be the spiritual leaders in the land at that time. And God says they're worthless. Now I want you to see a contrast here between these two groups. First off, we have, we have Samuel. He's being taught the things of God. Uh, he is, uh, has a tender heart toward God. And then we have the sons of Eli. And they're worthless men. They don't even know God at all. Yet these men are in charge of the people spiritually. The, these men knew the word of God. These men knew the expectations of God, but they did not see the importance of, listen, obeying God. They're worthless. They believed that they could live in any which way they wanted without any consequences, with anything that all, was going, with any kind of, of uh, result of their disobedience. And God has a plan, and he, they can either join that plan or not, and they're not joining it. Now, listen, let me just tell you something, a little quick note here. Your sin and my sin will affect us, but it will not affect God's plan. God's plan will continue to go forward. He's going to work his plan out. And you and I are going to either be a part of his plan or not. Now, it reminds me, when I was playing basketball in college, we had a coach. And this coach had a plan. He had a defensive strategy. He believed in, in, in tenacity. And he believed in if there was a loose ball, five guys on the court, all five of us were to dive on that loose ball. He had a, an offensive strategy. It was to, to be patient, get good shots, to be unselfish, all the things that he, that he had as a, a philosophy that he had in his mind, he shared. And we as players either joined that plan or we didn't. If we joined that plan, guess what? We got in the game. We got to play. If we didn't join that plan, if we rejected that plan, we spent four years perhaps sitting on the bench and not seeing the daylight of a court. And that's how it is with God. God's got a plan and he invites you and me to be a part of his plan. And, and, and when we fall into sin and we choose to sin, we're saying, I don't want to be a part of that plan. But God's plan will continue to go forward. One of the things I knew about my coach, hey, he loved us. Even if we didn't buy into his plan, the same is true with God. God loves you. Even if he chooses, if you choose not to, to obey him, even if you choose to rebel. So here's the big idea for this morning. Our personal rebellion 
will not change the plan of God. But our rebellion can change our part in it. Our personal rebellion will not change the plan of God, but our rebellion can change our part in it. God's plan is going to continue with or without you, with or without me, but God is inviting us to be a part of that plan. Phineas and Hopney, they said, I'm not going to be a part. Now, so let's, I have three points outlined this morning, and I want us to learn about rebellion. And along the way, we're going to figure out what is rebellion, what it looks like, and then how do we get out of rebellion if we find ourselves in that? So the first point in our outline is this. There was rebellion. And the first thing that we see about the rebellion is this. They were careless with the things of God. Take a look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. And he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Thus, the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Now, you say to me, great story, Rich. What does this have to do with me? Sounds like these boys like them some barbecue. They were hungry and they just wanted some meat. What proves that they were worthless men? So let me give you the picture. So these people are coming to sacrifice. They're coming with their sacrifice, meat, uh, an animal, meat that was to be offered to the Lord as a part of their atoning atonement, as a part of their sacrifice to get right with God. And the problem was, is that the, the meat and the, the sacrifice was for God. It wasn't for Hopni or Phineas. But these two boys said, hey, what is God's is mine. I'm gonna, we will take it. We'll take it by force if necessary. We are greedy men and we're gonna force the people to give it to me so they could get fat. You're gonna see that a little bit later here. Now, it's interesting that the, the priests in that day, God had a plan for feeding them. Matter of fact, some of the meat was to go to the priest. It was prescribed by the, the Old Testament law. They were to do it. But Hophni and Phinehas, nope, they're not listening to that. They're taking it by force. They foolishly believed that what belonged to God was theirs. So the first thing we learn is that there was, they were careless with the things of God. Here's the second thing we learn about rebellion. They were disobedient with the commands of God. God had made commands and they were disobedient. Look down, if you will, at 1 Samuel 2, 22. Now, Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they, listen to this, lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Okay. Now, it says they're laying with the women. Uh, they, they, this is... They're, they're not, they're not napping with the women. This is a discreet way of the Bible saying that these priests were taking sexual advantage of the women who had come to the house of the Lord, to the temple to worship. Can you imagine? These were the spiritual leaders. Can you imagine going to a church where pastors were taking spiritual advantage of the women who would come to worship at the people. Here, the, the, these priests were called to pray for the people and they're not praying for the people, they're praying upon the people for their own sexual gratification. Let me just pause here for a moment. I wanna talk about this. We happen to live in, in a day and age where 
everything is permissible among consenting adults. If two or more adults consent, then it's okay. It is permissible. And so we get to this point, and people both inside and outside the church might say something like this, what is morality? I mean, we're, we're years away from Samuel. What is morality? What is sexual morality? Here, here it is. You listening? Sexual morality is anything that is inside what God says is moral in the area of sexual activity. And you say to me, <laughs> that sounds countercultural. It is. What, what are you saying exactly, Rich? Let me put it simple. Sexual morality is this. One man, one woman, in one marriage. Now, I want to make this clear. I do not have a, a, a political axe to grind. I love you. And I want you to know the truth. The sign that's placed up is that this is sexual morality. Anything outside of this is, is immoral, sexual immorality. And people that they are racing past, driving past that, that sign at 70 or 80 miles an hour, ignoring it. And God says, no, this is still my standard. I don't have an axe to grind. This is God's standard. You, can, you think you can shack up with whoever you like if they're consenting adults? You think you can live in, in rebellion and have God's blessing on your life? You're wrong. Sexual immorality is sin. It is rebellion against God. And some people say, well, you know, Rich, I'll just keep it quiet. It, what happens behind the doors of consenting ad adults is their own business. I don't know who it was that said, but I'm going to put it up on the screen for you to see it. It's an anonymous source said this. The sin that is covered will be uncovered. For what you cover, he, speaking of God, will uncover. God sees everything. And the truth is, is that some people aren't even trying to cover anything. They're, they're celebrating their sin, celebrating their rebellion. And they stand up and they say, deal with it. Deal with it. I, 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 I reject the fact that God's standard of morality is one man, one woman in a single marriage. I reject that. Deal with it. And if you disagree with me, that's hate, hate speech. And if you disagree with me, I will cancel you because you're not in step with the culture that is racing past the sign at breakneck speed. Listen, I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to speak the truth in love this morning. We miss, you will miss God's blessing when you race past that, that sign in rebellion. So here it is. There's rebellion. First off, we learn they, they were careless with the things of God. Secondly, we learn they were disobedient with the commands of God. And here's the third. They did not value the presence of God. 1 Samuel 4, you can flip over there if you want or look at it at the screen here. Verse 11, it says this. And the ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, there it is, died. Now, 
the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, was this very, very precious thing to the children of Israel. God had prescribed the size of it. It was uh, 52 inches long. It was 31 inches high, 31 inches deep. And over the top of it were two angels peering in from each end. And the Ark of the Covenant was this place where the glory of God resigned. And it was kept in the holy of holy places. And nobody could go in there except the priest one time a year. It was a sacred place depicting the, the, the glory of God. So let me tell you what happened. The nation of Israel had an enemy. The enemy were the Philistines. And so they went into battle with the Philistines and uh, the nation of Israel really got whooped. They just got defeated. 4,000 people died in that battle. So the nation of Israel come back and they say, we know what the problem was. We didn't have God with us. And so what we're going to do is that we are going to take the Ark of the Covenant and we're going to bring that into battle. But we're going to go back into battle. We're going to take the Ark of the Covenant because this is God's glory. And we're going to bring it with us and we're going to go back into battle with the Philistines. And this time, surely we will win. Now, Phineas and Hopney were priests. They knew that that ark was to stay in the, ark, in the uh, Holy of Holies, but they sh didn't say, stop, wait a minute, this is not right. They just went along with it because everybody was doing it. It was, it was fine. So the nation of Israel goes back into battle, second round, they get whooped again. And this time the ark of the covenant is taken. Now, let me just pause for a moment. What ended up happening is Phineas and, and uh, Hophni think, and all the people think, that the ark is God. And they think that, the, that God's presence can only live in that little place inside the ark. They don't realize that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. And they're worshiping this little thing, thinking it's like a lucky charm or a rabbit's foot that they're going to bring and they're going to have success by bringing this into battle. They treat it as if God is here or there, but not all, everywhere. We, we can do the same thing on Sunday mornings, can't we? We can tune in on our devices and we can think this is my God time. And we can sit there and we can think, you know, um, I'll, I'll surrender to God, I'll worship, I'll think about Him, and then the rest of the week is my week. But God is everywhere. God is with us all the time, not just on Sunday mornings. So in the first battle, the, the Philistines kill 4,000 Israelites, and in the second battle, 30,000 people die in battle. They lose the Ark of the Covenant. And now they're really confused. And Hopni and Phineas die. The, their rebellion was subtle, racing past the signs along the freeway, but very, very real. They're, they're, they're thinking, hey, you know, it's just an ark. Just take it. Oh, the presence of God's in this ark. But the presence of God was already there. And the presence of God brought judgment on the nation of Israel and the nation of, and, and, and Hopni and Phineas as well. You say, well, their sin's their own business, isn't it? Let me ask you a question. How subtle is your sin? These are the types of questions I ask myself as I sit in my study and I prepare for a message like this. How subtle is my sin. Is it so subtle that you and I don't even realize it? Or, or is our sin not subtle at all? It's, it's sexual immorality, it's greed, it's arrogance, it's a bitter spirit, it's a critical spirit, it's slandering people. You, you fill in the blank and we just don't care. Hopney and Phineas we're not the only ones living in rebellion. So was Eli. Take a look at verse 29 of 1 Samuel 2. God says to Eli, why then do you scorn, or some of your translations might say, or kick at my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons, 
He's speaking to Eli, above me. By fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel. The truth was, this was not just something that Phineas and Hophni were doing. This is something that was happening in the sight of everyone. Eli knew it, and Eli was allowing it. See, rebellion doesn't just include what I do. It, it includes what I allow to take place in areas that I'm responsible for. Some of you are parents this morning, and we have kids who are, they live in rebellion, and we are to speak up and, and call them back, put the sign up in front of them and remind them of God's standard. It's also true in our growth groups. We are in a community. We're doing life together. And sometimes some of us get off the, pa the path, get off the trail. And it's important for us not to just look the other way. Well, that's their sin. No, we're in this together. Oh, you go ahead and sin. You're not hurting me. The Bible says we have a responsibility. And Eli is standing by, watching idly and saying nothing. And here's the truth. Listen carefully, church. Where there is rebellion against God, consequences will sooner or later follow. So, point number one, there was rebellion. Here's point number two. There was a consequence to the rebellion. Verse 11 says this. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And by the way, that's not a good thing. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. What were the consequences? Well, we've already talked about them. The first consequence was Israel was defeated in battle once. They were defeated in battle twice. Then we have the Ark of the Covenant that is stolen or taken. Then we have Hophni and Phinehas who die. And then Eli dies. Actually, word of the defeat in battle comes back to Eli. Remember Eli, he's a big, heavy man, set man. He's sitting on a stool. Word comes to him that the Ark has been taken, stolen. That Phineas, his son Phineas and Hophni are dead. They've lost in battle and Eli falls off the chair and he dies. And that's not even the end of it. His daughter-in-law, Eli's daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife is pregnant. And upon hearing that the Ark of the Covenant has been taken, hearing that her husband is dead, her brother-in-law is dead, her father-in-law is dead, she gives birth to a son. And she names him Ichabod, Ichabod. You say, well, what's the significance of that? Ichabod means the glory has departed from Israel. <laughs> Gone. Nobody wanted to hear that news on the nightly news. The glory had departed. They said, she said, that's going to be your name, boy, for the rest of your life. The glory has departed from Israel. Listen, I want you to understand something. There's consequences to my rebellion. There's consequences to your rebellion. Do we really think that we can live in rebellion against God and still receive his blessing? As believers, can we really live morally impure lives and expect God to just be okay with it, to bless us? Can we treat cheaply our commitment to our spouses and expect that to be okay with God? Can we lie? Can we cheat? Can we steal what Maybe it's time from your employer or, or a tithe and offering from God and think, oh, oh God, God, God's going to still bless me. Do, do we really think that? God's word says, listen, sin and rebellion is serious. And at some point, 
for me, there's going to be consequences. For you, there will be consequences. But even with all this sin, God is sovereign. And you know what? They couldn't thwart the plan of God. What they did was to take themselves out of the plan of God, but they could not thwart the plan of God. They're all dead. They're all gone. God took them out. Somebody's going to say to me, Rich, is God going to kill me? I'd like to say no. But because sin is serious and because of what I read, it's on the table for all of us. But Rich, I thought God was a loving God. I, Rich, you, you preach about God so loving the world that he gave his only son. You, you talk about love. Yeah, yeah. God is a loving God. And right alongside of that, God's love for you. He's also, are you listening? He's also a just God. And there's consequences for, for my sin. There's consequences for your sin. This is, this is where I wish I was on the other side of the camera. I was sitting there looking at this on my device, right? All of us. God's called us to purity. Now, we're not going to read the next couple of chapters this morning, but you can read ahead if you want. They took the Ark of the Covenant, and everywhere that Ark came, man, bad things happened, man. They should make a movie about that in Hollywood. I mean, it's amazing. Go ahead and read it. We, we're not going to read it this week, but you can read ahead. So there was a rebellion. There was rebellion, number one. Number two, there was a consequence to rebellion. Here's number three. There was the promise of God's faithfulness. Look, if you will, with me at 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord, and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. Now, you see, God has a plan. And God's plan, listen, for you and for me, is to have a close relationship with you and me. Did you know that? We were created to be in close relationship with the Lord. That is his plan. Sin is the thing that separated that, that plan, right? It separated that purpose, I should say. But God's plan is still to be in relationship with you. You say, how do we enter into that relationship? It starts by us confessing that we are sinners, realizing that we are separated from God, and believing that Jesus is God who died on the cross for our sins, who died for us, he rose again. And he is, by grace, he has offered us salvation through faith. We just believe, we accept that, and we are into that relationship with him. We enjoy that relationship. And then afterwards, as we live our lives, when we struggle and we fall into this rebellion, we need to respond. And we need to get back into that relationship with him. Here's the beautiful thing is that God is faithful. He is faithful to you and me. He's faithful to do what he says. Some of you this morning are, have been living in rebellion. And you say to me, Rich, how do I get out of this place of rebellion? I don't know. Maybe you're even sitting there thinking, man, I have really messed up. I guess God's going to do to me what he did to Hophni and Phinehas. He's going to kill me. Listen to me. Good news. You're not dead yet. That's great news, isn't it? God in his grace has given you an opportunity to this morning to, to, to come back to him through repentance, to come back and, and seek that close relationship for which you have been created. And God this morning is giving us a formula. Okay, I'm saved. I trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Okay, I have committed immorality. I am living in sin. Okay, I'm living in rebellion. Here's the formula. How do I get back? Here it is. Number one, 
Return to God alone. Return to God alone. Look what 1 Samuel 7, 3 says. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, this is what we call a conditional sentence. Look what it says. If, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, it's conditional, then put away the foreign gods and the Asheroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. I love that. Not he might deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines, but he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Wow, that is awesome. I don't know what your Philistine is. But you've got one. And it's battling you. And he says to you and me, if you will return to me. And then he says this, I will deliver who? You. I will deliver you. I love that promise. It's a promise from God's word that he will deliver us. The Israelites went into battle once. They lost. They went into battle twice. They lost. They thought God, you know, wherever, didn't have their lucky charm. That was about it, right? Maybe that's you this morning, right? You've been getting beat up by a habitual sin. And your Philistines, it's, it might not be two to zero. It might be 2,000 to zero, it feels like. He says, return to the Lord alone and he will deliver you. God's faithful. Here's the second part of the formula. Remove whatever it is that you desire more than God. Verse four says this. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they serve the Lord only. You do not only need to return to him, you need to remove whatever it is that you desire more than God. The Bible calls this idolatry, where we worship something above God and you say, Rich, I'm not idolatrous. The Bible says, if you are placing anything in your life above your commitment and obedience to God, that is, you're worshiping an idol. It can be lust. It can be greed. It can be unforgiveness. It can be laziness. It's above who God is and what he's called you to be. God doesn't say, oh, return to me and go hang on. Just keep, you know, just keep worshiping the Baals and the Asheroth. It's, it's fine. He says, no, let go of them. Get rid of those things. Maybe this means you get more accountability in your life. Maybe you stop visiting a common watering hole. Maybe this has to do with what you view on, online. Let it go. I, I love this. Return to me and I'll deliver you. He says, oh, let go of these things. Listen, you're still alive. God in his grace has not taken you out yet, not taken me out yet. I, we have opportunity today. Here's the third part. Repent of your rebellious ways. 1 Samuel 7, verse 6 says, So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. That's repentance, right? We have sinned against the Lord. What are we doing? We admit it. So, listen, some of you just need to admit it. Let's start with that. 
I'm afraid to tell God what I've been up to. He already knows. He already he watches. He sees it all. He knows. And by his grace, you're still alive. You admit it. You confess it. This is sin, Lord. What I'm doing is sin. I'm going to tell you about it. Yeah, can I tell you something? When you tell God about it, it doesn't, it's not so you help God out. It's so it helps you out. You call it what it is. I mean, how many of us have had children, right, growing up, and, and you catch them in a lie? I mean, all of a sudden there's some cookies, chocolate chip cookies that are missing, right? And all of a sudden you notice them and, and you say, hey, did you take the cookies? No, I didn't take the cookies. He got chocolate all over his face, you know. No, I didn't take the cookies. You go, yeah, I know you took the cookies. Oh, no, no. And what are you trying to get your child to do? To admit it. That's how we are. God's saying, you know what? And, and you know, let me go back to this because this is important. When, when your child is denying it, you're trying to help him admit it, repent, right? But you still love him. God still loves you. He still loves me. But next up, we return to God alone. We remove whatever we desire more than him. And we repent. Repentance is this 180 degrees. I'm walking this way toward lust. I'm walking this way toward greed. I'm walking this way toward a bitter spirit. I'm walking this way toward pride and arrogance. And I say, no, Lord, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to follow you. I repent. Here's the fourth part. I love this. God restores 1 Samuel 7 verse 10 says this, The Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. Guess who was defeated in battle this time? The Philistines. Listen. Listen, child of God, brother, sister in the Lord, listen. Listen. God wants to do battle for me. He wants to do battle for you. He wants to defeat our Philistines. Israel had been defeated twice. We've been defeated many times, but not this time. Now God defeats the enemy. What he's calling you and me to do is to trust him. Stop racing past those signs saying, turn around. The grapevine is closed don't ignore them any longer. Turn around. Repent, and guess what? He'll restore you. Why? Why does He restore you? Here, listen, don't miss this. We're wrapping this thing up. He wants this relationship with you. He doesn't want this... Dis he wants this close, intimate relationship with me, with you. Church, what's your rebellion? I don't have any rebellion, Rich. We all do. We all do. What is, you, what is it that you do that is opposite of what God is calling you to do? To be involved in. Listen, God's got a plan. I, I, just, I don't want to be one of those guys that misses out on being a part of that plan. God's plan is going to be accomplished with or without me. And I just want it to be with me. God's plan is going to continue, but we will miss out if we're rebellious. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30 says this. God says this. Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be, you'd think it'd say, be despised, right? <laughs> but he doesn't say that. Those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Isn't that interesting? Lightly esteemed. Rich, what's that mean? It means that you will not have what God really wants for you to have. You'll not have that full blessing. You'll not have the joy of that closeness with God. You won't be able to enjoy your life like God really wants you to. And those who live in rebellion, he'll, God still loves you, but you're going to miss out. You'll be lightly esteemed, not enjoying the fullness of the blessing that God has for you. Our 
personal rebellion will not change the plan of God. But our rebellion can change our part in it. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning. And it has been convicting to me that the subtle sins, the subtle rebellions in my heart of arrogance, of pride, of, of, of just all these different things, Lord, is insignificant. And yet your word has placed up these road signs, warning us, telling us, turn around before it's too late. Turn around. And Lord, through your spirit this morning, I want to pray that you would speak to our hearts. Convict us. Uh, we, we sin, Lord, because it's fun. <laughs> I'm sure old Hophni and Phineas were having a lot of fun. But there would be consequences. And Lord, your standards of morality are true. And Lord, regardless of how many other people may speed past those road signs, Lord, may we as your followers who love you, Lord, who've been saved, who've been, received your grace and your mercy and your presence in our life and your encouragement, your strength, your blessings, may we stop and heed the signs. Oh, Lord, we love you. And while your heads are still bowed, I want to just talk to those of you this morning who've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Listen, you're battling sin. God's standard has, doesn't change. It's perfection. We will never be perfect, but we have a solution. God gave us a solution. Jesus, who died for you on the cross that you might come into a close relationship with him. And if you've never done that before, I want to invite you this morning. The Bible says that God so loved you that he gave his only son that if you will believe in him, he will give you, he'll forgive you and give you eternal life. I want to invite you to pray with me this morning, to invite Jesus to be your savior, to come into that close relationship with him this morning. Just pray with me. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And today I trust you. You died on the cross for my sin. Forgive me. You rose from the dead because you're God and I trust you with my life. Help me as I battle the Philistines in my life today. I want to enjoy the purpose for which you've created me. I trust you and I want to follow you, Jesus. And Lord, for those who prayed that prayer, Lord, may they reach out to our staff who are online right now and may they just let us know so that we can pray with them and encourage them. I again, thank you for the time, this time of being in your word. Thank you that your word does not return void. So you, may your spirit continue to work in our lives as we battle our Philistines this week. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching Hessel Online. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on the latest content and share this with a friend. If you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for watching and may God bless you.